I don't know how much academic uh, uh, papers you read, but they're not exciting to read and they're not exciting to write. They're very formulaic, uh, they're uninteresting, you can't tell jokes, uh, they're, they're unflexible. So a few years ago, I decided to write something more flexible that would let me just write for fun. And I decided to write a cookbook. And my cookbook was going to be titled Dining Without Crumbs, The Art of Eating Over the Sink. And it was going to be a decision-making kind of perspective on the kitchen. You know, the kitchen is where we create and destroy and experiment and take care of people and fail. It's kind of a wonderful place, take risks. And I was going to analyze decisions in the kitchen and try to suggest some lessons for life, but also give recipes. And I have two types of recipes. I had single meal dishes, patai, pa paella, kind of efficient things, and meals to woo, if, if you want to have somebody for dinner, what do you do? And I wrote like a book proposal, and I took it to MIT Press, and I took it to some book agents, and everybody said, you can't, you can't possibly sell this book. It's not a cookbook, you're not a comedian, it's not a decision-making book, we don't know what to do with this. And eventually one book agent suggested to me that um, what they should do is they should write a book about my research. And once I publish my first book, and somebody knows me, then I could publish my cookbook. So I decided if that's the cost I have to bear, that's the cost I have to bear. And I started writing a, a book about my research. And you know, this is what I wanted to avoid. I wanted to avoid the formulaic, kind of standard, uh, soulless uh, writing. And uh, what happened to me was incredibly fortunate. I met this uh, book agent called Jim Levine, and he liked my research. And he asked me to write a chapter, and he thought the chapter that I wrote was just not exciting. And he, the next time, he helped me, and he wrote with me together a chapter, and he showed it to people, and they thought it was not sufficiently exciting. And for four months, we went back and forth with draft and ideas and how to write it, and uh, it took a while. And finally, we, we found a, a voice and a language, and we found something that is actually much closer to how I speak about my research rather than how I write about it. But it took me a while to, to get there. And from that point on, it was a pure pleasure to write it. In fact, I didn't expect how much fun it would be to write, but it turns out to be uh, fantastically fun. These chapters, each chapter describes a, a, a research project. And uh, all of these research projects are like kids in a sense, right? They're all my offsprings and I love them all and I don't want to, uh, to say. Um, for me, uh, there's a couple of chapters that I love, I particularly love the research behind them. Uh, the first one is maybe this experiment we did on social security numbers and what people are willing to pay for things. And uh, here's the basic setup. Uh, we take a big, cl big class of students and we ask each of them to write down the last two digits of the social security number. So mine would be 79. I would write 79 next to each of six products. And then you would say, 79, let's make it $79. Would you pay $79 for each of those products? And I would say, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And I said, okay, now let's do it for real, which means you'll submit a bid for an auction where the highest bidder would pay and get the auction and get the stuff and so on. And everybody does it. Everybody submits their bid. We input it into a computer. We find the highest bidder. People pay and get what they, what they got. And now I go back to the office and I compute the relationship between people's social security numbers and their willingness to pay in the bid. Now, it sounds like a strange idea that these numbers will be connected. And in fact, they're not connected. It's not that somebody who was born with a high social security number is doomed to pay more for things. But what we did was to make the first decision about social security number, and then the question is, will the second decision take the first decision into account? And we found that this was indeed the result in a big way. So people with high social security numbers, let's say ending in 90 or something like that, were willing to pay at the end of the day hundreds of percent more than people who had the social security number ending in 10, let's say. Why? Because those people answered the first question, will I be willing to pay 90 for this? And they say yes or no. And when they came to say the second answer, they took the first one in consideration. They said, I just said no to 90. So how much would I be willing to pay? Maybe 80. Whereas the people who started with 10 said, yes, I'll pay 10. They say, okay, the second question, how much would you pay? He said, well, I just said yes to 10. Maybe I'll go up to 15 or 20. And they stayed too far from, from converging. Now, 
The reason I like that experiment is, first of all, I think it's it's cute demonstration, but more importantly, I think it tells us something very important about the way we actually make decisions and a way in which initial decisions have an incredible power on us and create a habit. And to illustrate this, let me give you a, a story about Starbucks. Okay, So imagine the following scenario. Uh, it's 10 years ago, you walk down the street, you're tired, you're uh, thirsty, you need caffeine, you're on some errands, you hate what, what you're doing, uh, you want some coffee. Dunkin' Donuts is six blocks away, you stumble on Starbucks. Never tried before, you go in. You go in, you buy a cup of coffee, you're surprised by the price, but you buy a cup of coffee, you leave, the coffee is fine. Three days later, you, you, you walk by again. What do you remember? You remember how thirsty you were, how caffeinated deprived you were, how tired you were, how annoyed you were with your tasks? No, I mean, we don't even remember how you felt yesterday. What you do remember is your actions. Remember, I was here before, and I made a decision to go into Starbucks. And then you say something else to yourself. You say, that must mean that going into Starbucks is the right decision for me. So you go again. And the next time you go, you say, oh my goodness, this is a place I've gone twice. It must be a really good decision for me. And you go again and again and again until it becomes a habit. And until you no longer consider whether Starbucks is giving you enough value for the money, you just say, that's the kind of person I am. This is what I do.